welcome to Top Gear Tested. Welcome to the Nissan GTR Nismo. What is it? Nissan first showed a 21st century Skyline concept car 20 years ago, way off back in 2001. That became the production ready GTR by late 2007 and it's been steadily upgraded, uprated and upvoted ever since until we get to the final boss, the latest GTR Nismo. The GTR is at heart a big two-door coupe with a twin turbo V6 up front, a six-speed twin clutch gearbox up back and four-wheel drive doing the business on each axle. The Nismo, that's Nissan Motorsport, removes weight, adds power and geeks out on the tiniest details to give us the most extreme track-ready road car Nissan has ever made. I'm talking details like removing one groove from the Dunlop tyres to increase rubber contact patch by 11%. That is the sort of nerdiness you get for £180,000. What does it look like? Oh, it's an absolute unit. Look, it's big, blocky, imposing, slab-sided, and then the Nismo just underlines all of that with red pinstriping, glossy carbon fibre, and a snowboard of a rear wing. If you want an all-wheel drive supercar with a touch of class, might I suggest a Porsche 911 Turbo instead. What's the engine? Well, like every R35 GTR, we've got a hand-built 3.8-litre twin-turbo V6. But the Nismo has some motorsport fettling. These turbos are actually from the R35 GTR GT3 racing car. They are 14.5% lighter, they have one fewer vein in them, and they spool up 24% faster, apparently. I didn't tell you it was a nerd. There's no quoted increase in power, but you still get just shy of 600 horses, and the reduced turbo lag makes the car even quicker through the gears. Yikes. How does the all-wheel drive system work? Well, she has a name, you know. They call it a Tessa ETS Pro. And no, I can't remember what that stands for. Apparently, it's... Advanced Total Traction Engineering System for all-terrain with electronic torque split, obviously. Basically, what you've got to remember is that the GTR's engine makes power that then has to do a U-turn in the middle of the car. It comes down one drive shaft to go to the gearbox at the back and then up to 300 horsepower has to turn around and come back down a second drive shaft to the front wheels all over again. And how much drive that front axle actually gets is adjusted by sensors telling hydraulic clutches what you're up to. So it can be 98% rear wheel drive at launch, but still send half of its power frontwards to drag you out of a corner. And that means that like a proper racing car, the GTR really hates going slowly. When you're parking, it's grinding and shuntering and shunting about the place. This is absolutely not a sports car for posers. Is it practical? For a Nürburgring destroying monster, not too bad. Enough room in the front seats for a proper adult, just about enough space behind them for a human child, and though the boot is a real pain to load, it's enormous back here. Will I get along with the tech? Well, it's not exactly difficult to operate, but it just feels dated. When this car came along, people were saying, ah, oh, it's so complicated, it feels like I'm sitting in a PlayStation. But now, no one would tolerate these graphics on a modern console, and the buttons feel like they've come out of, well, a 15-year-old car nothing like as slick as what the Germans are selling you these days. Look, I've even got a manual handbrake cleaver. But credit where credit's due, everything does feel absolutely bomb-proof. Even though this is the hardcore GTR, you never feel like you've had the bailiffs in to nick all of the equipment. There's dual zone climate control, Apple CarPlay, you get automatic lights and wipers, and even the lightweight Recaro bucket seats have electric backrest adjustment. Surely in a car that's so obsessed with weight saving, they've created bespoke alloy wheels that save 100 grams each, they should have just put the seat motors in the bin. What does it weigh? Well, the GTR has been many things, but never a light car. And Nissan says well, that's entirely deliberate because weight gives you stability and traction, and then you can just engineer your way around the problem with clever differentials and lots of electronics. But the Nismo, that's got lightweight wheels, carbon brakes, and plenty of carbon fiber all over the body. 
So let's investigate. It should be 1,703 kilos, but this one with half a tank of fuel, 1,732 kilos, which makes it slightly heavier than a standard car. But don't worry, I'm sure next year there'll be a special edition GTR with a lightweight door mirror package. How fast is it? Some acceleration. Now, in the real world, you only get one shot at this. So do I. We're gonna put the differential into our mode. I'm gonna have comfort on the dampers because I think that might give us a little bit more traction as the car settles down at the back where it's sending 98% of the drive. Traction control is in R mode and leave the gearbox in automatic. So I think it can probably change gear faster than I can pull the paddle. Then we simply mash the brake, mash the throttle, foot off the brake. Oh, traction spot on. Didn't get any wheel spin. Have warmed the tyres, so expecting it to just hold its line nicely. That is well over 100 miles an hour, which is all the data we need. Carbon ceramic brakes bringing us down to a stop. Let's have a look at the data that we've got here on our GPS enabled box of acceleration tricks. The all wheel drive GTR Nismo accelerated to 60 miles an hour in 3.3 seconds and went from 0 to 100 in 7.2 seconds. I know, I've seen GTRs go faster too. I've seen GTRs go sub three seconds, but here we are, half a tank of petrol, only one person on board. Maybe we'd expect a little bit faster, but that's what we got. This is Nissan UK's own GTR Nismo as well. So we can be pretty confident that it is A, perfectly standard, and B, looked after extremely particularly. The GTR Nismo completed the quarter mile in 11.35 seconds at a top speed of 126.7 miles per hour. For an old car, you'd have to say in a straight line, and Nismo's still got it. Is it comfy? Yeah. Oh, ow. Oh. Well, if there's one thing we've learned about GTRs over the past decade and a half, it's that they tend to be pretty firm. They're stiff. The Nismo, well, it's living up to that tradition. This version actually has retuned dampers, but they've been retuned for racetracks, for lap times. Not for our tame Belgian motorway here. Now, I can help out matters by trying to put it in comfort mode. Let's see if we can hit the switch. Yep, the green light's on, we're in comfort. Problem is that a GTR's idea of comfort is where every other car in the world is in kind of hyper race sport plus mode. I'm honestly surprised that the steering wheel hasn't come off in my hands yet. What's it like on a motorway? Well, it's a big coupe with an automatic gearbox, so it's gonna be tremendously civilized, isn't it? No, no it's not. A GTR is not like all the other coupes. A GTR has lots of wind noise, lots of tyre noise, and the engine is ever-present burbling away. But you've got to remember that a Porsche 911 Turbo suffers from pretty similar foibles as well. If you're buying into the GTR, you kind of forgive it the fact that it's a bit of a rough and ready ride on the motorway. I think if I had the choice between driving one of these to the Nürburgring or sticking it on a trailer, ah, leave the tow bar at home, and just take the Nismo. And that would mean that once I got to Germany, we could go really fast. Speed, you say? Yep, the GTR has got speed to spare. That just feels unstoppable. I mean, we're sat at 130 here, but we are going around a constant corner on this banked bowl. Still feels absolutely rock steady. A couple of years ago, I drove one of these to the Lausitz ring in Germany on the Autobahn in a straight line. It was sat at 160. Felt so rock steady, so full of momentum. You could crash through a brick wall and not even come off boost. A GTR, it's just got this unstoppable force about it. Feels like the love child of a, oh, I don't know, a bullet train and a sumo wrestler, if that's not too many Japanese cliches for you. What's it like in a corner? The thing is, if you just potter about in a GTR, it's ponderous. You start to resent it. You start to wonder, why am I putting up with this dated interior, with all these clunks and rattles, with the punishing ride, the awful fuel economy? 
And why am I paying 180,000 quid for a Nissan? You see, the thing is with a GTR, as we've come to realize, you only really get the rewards out of them when you get stuck in. What about if you're late for something? Yep, this is when you can start to explore the GTR's harder mythology. What it's all about, feeling the car thinking underneath you, clawing grip it has no right to, out of the surface, monster traction, absolutely crackers turning. Get these carbon ceramic brakes, the first ever on a factory GTR, up to temperature and it stops like a bulldozer. But if you don't, you probably won't stop at all. You've got to work hard to keep the car on boost. This is the whole thing about the GTR. It is human and machine and quite a lot of computer occasionally arguing, but when they learn to get along, it's a complete tonic and an otherworldly experience from just about any other fast car. All GTRs are basically a collision between heavy duty mechanical engineering and sci-fi technology. I guess that's what makes them such a love-hate car. They blend two opposing worlds, two ways of doing fast cars into one not always harmonious whole. Something about the giant killer to the GTR Ignore the badge, even 14 and a half years on from its launch, it is still completely unique, absolutely addictive, and it'll be a dark day for the car world when they don't make this monster anymore. Woohoo! What's the verdict? Can I make a confession? I'm absolutely exhausted. God, working a GTR hard. But it's hard work. I just have no time for those people who used to go on about this thing being a computer game because they'd got confused about it having the graphics on the screen developed by the same people who brought you Gran Turismo for the PlayStation. This thing's nothing like any computer game I've ever played. I mean, I've never stood up from my Xbox and needed a sit down in a darkened room and a cold shower, which is what I'm going to want after this. I've got this far without calling it Godzilla, but it truly is the perfect nickname for a car that's sort of morphed into an unkillable alien life form now, all mutated and grotesque and kind of out of this world. This isn't a car anymore. It's something different. It's a subculture, a culture of tuning, of changing the way the thing looks, of boosting how it drives but of just always remaining true to the bloody-minded Japanese-ness that makes this thing like no other car. I mean, it's outlived, what, two, three generations of Porsche 911 Turbo now? And they've got faster and they've got comfier and the GTR's just kept going its own way. I wouldn't have it any other way. I reckon even Nissan themselves have got no idea how to replace this thing. Go mid-engined, hybrid, electric. The GTR has truly become a legend in its own lifetime. God, they just don't make them like they used to. Yes, ah, never die, GTR.